So imagine you were given the task of computing the following indefinite integral. One thing you could try is a substitution, like u equal to tan x, and you quickly realize the thing that you're left with isn't really nice to integrate. Or you could try an approach by parts, and you quickly get into trouble as well. In this video, we'll see how to compute this integral using a really cool symmetry argument where we interchange sine and cosine to be able to figure out the problem at hand. Hey, welcome to today's video, I'm Prof Omar. Today we're interested in computing the integral of the square root of 10x dx. And we're gonna do that using a symmetry argument. So we're gonna start by letting this integral be i1. That's the variable we're gonna use for it. Now the symmetry we're gonna have is interchanging the role of sine and cosine. So if we do that, tangent will become cotangent. So we'll write i2 as the integral of the square root of cotangent x dx. Okay, so to figure out the integral of i1, what we're going to do is symmetrize by adding these and subtracting them and seeing what kind of integrals we get for those. So the sum of the two integrals is the integral of the square root of tan x plus square root of cotangent x dx. All right, so a natural thing to do right now is to write these in terms of sine and cosine. So we'll have the square root of sine x over cosine x plus the square root of cosine x over sine x dx. And then now we'll put these into a common denominator and see what we get. Okay, if we do that, hopefully we'll have some type of cancellation or at least write this in terms of things that are kind of familiar that allow us to do things like substitution or maybe by parts. Um, so if we do that here, we'll get root sine x times root sine x plus root cosine x plus uh, times root cosine x all divided by the square root of sine x times the square root of cosine x dx. Okay, now luckily for us, these two square root factors that are being multiplied, both of them in the sum end, um, clear things out so that we're left with a sine x and a cosine x in the numerator. But we still have this square root of sine times cosine in the denominator. Now, one thing that would be nice is if you could somehow change that sine cosine of the denominator so that it had something like a sine minus cosine or expressed in terms of sine minus cosine. And we kind of can do that. And the reason to do that is because it'll help with the substitution by recognizing that sine x cosine x can be written in terms of uh, these trigonometric functions in the following way. We can take twice sine cosine x, and it's a term in the expansion of sine of x minus cosine of x squared. So we can write this as one minus one plus two sine x cos x, which then we can put together using the fact that sine squared plus cosine squared itself is one, right? And using that, we get this is one minus the quantity sine of x minus cosine x squared. Now you might have not seen that immediately, but the idea is we knew sine x cosine x appears in the expansion of sine x minus cosine x squared. So we can fill it with things around to, to be able to get this kind of expression. So now if we make that um, actual computation in there, um, we get the sine x cosine x that we had in the numerator with this one minus sine of x minus cosine x all squared. And we have a root two here because we have to divide all that by two to express this as sine x uh, times cosine x. Because it's two sine cosine x, sine x cosine x that equals the expression that we just did the substitution for. Okay, so now we have a great situation. The thing we're squaring in the denominator has derivative that's on the numerator. So we make a substitution letting t equals sine x minus cosine x then dt by dx is cosine x plus sine x, because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Great. So then our integral now by the substitution, or the integral of the sum of these two things, or the sum of the two integrals we're interested in, is the square root of 2 multiplied by the integral of 1 over the square root of one minus t squared dt. And this integral is an integral that we can look up in integral tables if we're not familiar, or it's an integral that we know is arc sine of t. 
So this quantity then turns out to be the square root of 2 times arc sine t. I'll leave the plus constant out because we know to include that at the end of all of this process. And now substituting back in what t was in terms of x, we get the square root of 2 times arc sine of sine x minus cos x. Great. So now we know what to do with the sum of these two integrals. That is a piece of what we need in order to figure out the original integral which we wanted, which was i1 completely on its own. Okay, so at least let's write down the fact that we have this sum now. i1 plus i2 is the square root of arc sine of the expression that we had below. All right, so it's arc sine of sine of x minus cosine of x. Great. Okay, so now we're wondering about what about the difference. Now, as you can imagine, the difference is going to take on the same type of approach, but the integral itself might look quite different, and the substitution we have to do, like we did before, might look quite different. So the beginning pieces look the same, where we have each of the square root of tan x and square root of cotangent x written in terms of sine and cosine. Okay, we do the same sort of process that we had before where we'll clear denominators and write this all in terms of one denominator. So again, like we did before, we will get as the denominator the square root of sine times cosine. And we'll quickly say that the numerator is going to be sine x minus cos x, because those get the two copies of root sine x and the two copies of root cosine x, like we did before. Okay, so now we have this sine x cos x, but we want to express this now in terms of sine x plus cosine x, because the derivative of that is what we have in the numerator. Okay, so... If we look at sine x plus cosine x squared, that quantity is 1 plus 2 sine x cos x because the sine squared and the cosine squared add up to 2 cosine x. Okay, so we get the sine of x minus the cosine of x in the numerator, and the denominator will express this as uh, sine x plus cosine x all squared. And then we have to subtract 1 and then include the square root. So there should have been an inclusion of the square root here to balance that square root two that we have. So we'll make the substitution that t is sine x cosine x, and then dt then is cosine x minus sine x, which is actually the negative of the numerator that we have. Okay, so with that substitution, we can go back to what our actual integral is gonna be, the difference of i1 and i2 now is going to be the following. It is the negative, because we have this interchange in what substitution we did. We have the root 2, which we remembered this time. And then we get the integral of something that might not look the most familiar. It's the square root of the 1 over t squared minus 1 dt. Now this actually has a known uh, integration, but it's not something that's very commonly uh, talked about. It's actually the arc hyperbolic cosine of t. But the point is it's something that we can figure out or look up. So the difference of i1 and i2 is negative arc, hyperbolic arc cosine of sine of x plus cosine of x and now we can bring everything home into our final expression. By adding these two, we'll get two copies of i1. So i1 is a half of their sum, which is this expression right over here. So we'll put that in the sum, and there we go. So that pretty much finishes off exactly the thing we wanted. We're happy, and we have the integral that we got by doing this cool, fantastic symmetry argument.